So recently, I wanted to do a project where I could combine live action footage of a real world diorama with visual effects and CGI to enhance the imagery that you can get from footage of live action dioramas. So in this project, I created a model of mountains, I 3D printed that model, I painted that model, then built a system using a stepper motor and a Raspberry Pi to spin that model around along with the light to keep the light stationary. And then I recorded the footage with a variety of different settings to give me some options, and I started adding some 3D elements into the shot to make a ethereal looking mountain shot. So this is part diorama, part live action, and it's part CGI and visual effects. So in this video, I'm going to provide an overview of how this project got put together. To get our terrain data, I used Blender's GIS add-on. This allows you to access basically a Google Earth user interface, and I can select a random area, and there you can see I just scrolled to a random place in the Midwest, and we have elevation data, and we can create a mesh from it. Our mountains are from a random part of the Rocky Mountains, and I've extended the scale on the z-axis to uh, exaggerate the relief. Here it is in Cura, we are slicing it for 3D printing, and you can see the density inside. It's not very dense, because we don't need it to be. But it's a big print, and here's a time lapse of it printing over about 14 to 15 hours on the Ender 3. Now, our model was in pretty good shape coming right off the printer, but you can see some stair stepping at the base of those mountains and some residual filament at the top of those peaks, you know, some little hairs. So I sanded it down and used Wooden Scenics foam putty to fill in those stair steps and imperfections. For our stepper motor, I'm using a NEMA 17 bipolar stepper motor. So this is pretty exact, we can get some really good results. And this is a custom bracket that I modeled and 3D printed to hold the NEMA 17, so it's precisely measured so that it'll fit right over it and hold it to the table. A stepper motor needs to be controlled precisely precisely because it works by turning magnets on and off. So we're using the Raspberry Pi connected via GPIO pins to our stepper motor controller. So the Raspberry Pi is going to use a Python script to tell a controller when to send 12 volt pulses to the magnets inside of our stepper motor, and that's how it moves forward in little pulses. So the Raspberry Pi is using Python to do that. Think of our L298N controller as the middleman between the Raspberry Pi and the motor. And depending on the order in which we turn those magnets on and off, we can move it either direction. So starting off painting our terrain, I had some references but I ended up using just a gray base, so a light gray base evenly distributed across the mountains for a nice base rock color. Then I started to think about where sediment would collect, so any flat areas or low-lying areas, I added some dark brown tones uh, because those would be the more fertile areas where sediment collects. Very early on, I started adding some lighter colors to the tops of the mountains to represent snow and ice. I started to work in some green to depict where different foliage would be, different color greens and things of that nature. I also used a variety of Woodland Scenics products for this project, mainly foliage, fine foliage, fine turf, and some snow, and some ballast, and I started to work in these elements very slowly. Uh, I started by sprinkling some fine turf, some fine green turf over the, the lowlands, and I'm securing it with a glue dilution, and the goal here was to make sure that lighter foliage existed where less water would be naturally in the environment, and darker foliage would be where there is more water. Uh, I also used a grout and soil mixture for the base terrain texture and some lighter woodland scenics turf as needed. The peaks of the mountains got some white acrylic paint and some woodland scenic snow and some woodland scenics realistic water and water effects for the tops of those mountains. So here I am securing the Nevis 17 with that custom bracket I mentioned earlier. Uh, the stepper motor moves in steps, so it's important to keep it secure. Here's a custom printed uh, piece that I also modeled. It's very dense, 80% infill, so it's basically a solid piece of plastic and a metal tripod thread on one side that's hot glued in there. I precisely measured and tapered the hole in this piece so it would perfectly fit the Nevis 17 shaft. I'm using the Nanlite Lumiped 11 for this project. It's a nice, lightweight, small LED panel, and it fits right onto our tripod thread, as you can see there. doesn't put too much weight on our stepper motor, and with a counterbalance, it'll work perfectly. You can see how nicely it moves right there. This is what it looks like turned on. I'm using the warmest light setting available. I had a piece of extruded polystyrene to secure our model tube because since this is a stepper motor, it's going to be moving in little pulses and you can actually see it in the final footage. We need to make sure that it's as secure as possible. Here's a clamp that's also acting as a counterbalance to our light. So the thinking was that this would at least mitigate those little pulses caused by the stepper motor. The Python script that will be moving our stepper motor is a script that I found online and altered. So I'm going to be typing in the number of steps every time I want it to move. Typically it's 400 steps for a full rotation. I'm using a white fluorescent light on a blue screen 
screen to simulate the sky. So any residual light that you would get from the sky, hopefully that's what this is going to simulate. It should turn our shadows a little bit bluish. Here's what it looks like rotating. To prevent the wires from getting tangled, I would type in 400 for a counterclockwise rotation and then negative 400 for a clockwise rotation. So I would just reverse back and forth and back and forth each subsequent take. I shot this in two formats, 4K 30fps and 1080p 60fps. So the 1080p version we can slow down because we have 60 frames per second, but since it's 1080, we can't crop in later because we have no more resolution, so we have to zoom in closer. But with the 4K version, it's only 30 FPS, so we can't slow it down, but we can crop in later. So here are those results. Like I said, we can't crop with the 1080p version, but we can slow it down because we have twice the FPS that we need. I shot it with both high and low f-stops. On the left, we can see the high f-stops, so we have a wider depth of field, more things are in focus, and on the right, a low f-stop, so it's a shallow depth of field, more things are out of focus, it's more narrow. So we had two options to play with. With our 4K version, I didn't have to zoom in nearly as close because since it's 4K, we can crop it later. So I zoomed it out and that's what this looks like. Uh, I really only got good results with the lower f-stop, so this way I can choose later on what parts of the scene to focus on by panning around uh, because we have enough resolution because it's 4K, we just can't slow it down because it's only 30 FPS. So at the end of the day, I decided to go with 1080p 60 FPS. I found that I needed a longer shot. I needed something that was about 30 seconds long, and I couldn't make the steps in the stepper motor go that slow without causing some jarring results. So 60 FPS made sense. I could slow it down by a factor of two. So of course, as with most of my projects, we start here in the motion tracker. So with the mountain, fortunately, I have a lot of stationary points on the rock itself, but eventually I got something that looks pretty good. I mean, by slowing this down, we got a nice long shot that extends all the way out to the back of the mountain. Now, of course, the whole point of this project is to incorporate visual effects and CGI elements into our live action shots. The first thing I had thought of was adding a lake. Once you have your tracking scene set up, you can start to add these elements in. This is just a plane that I extruded into this object. I added a subdivision surface and then two displacements on the X and Y axes to, you know, give it some natural looking curvature and then an ocean modifier set to displace. And then I'm animating the time property so that we get some nice wavelets. And I'm using an 8K HDR our image for our background and for our lighting for all of these shots. But for the water, these edge rocks were also rendered in a separate pass, so that isn't in the same pass as this water. I really quickly projection mapped certain elements of our environment onto basic planes. So these planes don't actually show up in our final render, they're only visible in glossy materials, so they serve to uh, be the reflection in our water, essentially. Now, our birds were a lot of fun. These are basically instanced collections that I'm altering for each collection, and they're all parent to a base uh, empty that's moving them forward. Here are the two collections of birds that I created. Basically, they are just planes that I extruded and modeled a little bit. They have a subdivision surface modifier and a solidify modifier. Two shape keys, one for the wings down and one for the wings up. I use the nonlinear animation editor to just create a looping animation, keyframing the values of these two keys from zero to one and then back again. Here's what that looks like in the nonlinear animation editor. So basically, this is just a action strip looped and looped. And each of these birds has one of those, but they they are set to different offsets and also the strip uh, playback speed is changed. You can see here this one's 0.6, this one's playback speed is 1, this one's playback speed is 0.8, so I'm creating variation already. Then I keyframed each one of these birds uh, position and I used the graph editor and added a modifier to each of these uh, F curves. So most of these birds have a very slight variation using the noise modifier on their Z location and Y location and X location sometimes and I adjusted the offset and phase to just add some variation between each bird. So each bird is moving very slightly relative to the rest of the birds and that goes for rotation as well. But ultimately, all of these birds stay relatively close to each other. They're just randomly moving and rotating relative to each other. And they're flapping their wings at different speeds. Then I created a, another collection that was almost the same. You go to collection instance and you can create a instance of your collection so it doesn't waste memory on calculating completely new meshes. It knows it's an exact copy. So our birds are randomly enough placed and randomly moving enough that it basically looks like random birds. It does not look like copies of an instance collection. And this right here is an entirely in different collection. That's the second collection that we created. Now I wanted to add some activity in the back here so I added a biplane and I added a hot air balloon. 
Both of these are very simple models. They may look pretty cool from far away, but up close you can tell that these are low quality models. I really just th threw them together in two seconds because they don't need a lot of detail. This hot air balloon is probably the most complex. I just added these ridges procedurally. This is the node setup for those ridges. Basically what I'm doing is I'm using these stops in the color ramp and I'm drawing them from the base of the balloon to the top of the balloon. See, I I'm separating out the X and Y components of the object vector and then I'm adding that object vector back to the Y component of the normal vector. So this stuff gets very complicated and it's really just trial and error, but eventually I got them to bend according to the normal. So you get these ridges like you see in real hot air balloons and I'm really just using that as a bump map. And for those clouds, here's what we were dealing with. It's just a principal volume of just two different types of noise uh, multiplied. So the Veroni texture is basically cutting pieces out of the noise texture to create even more variation. I also used 4D noise so that we have a W factor so that I can animate these going over time. So there's a very slight animation on those. Also something I should mention, uh, depth of field is important. This is just, you know, using your best judgment. I, I try to match the depth of field because our f-stop isn't going to be exactly the same as our actual camera f-stop because the scale of the scene is different and things like that but you just try to match it as best you can so here we are in after effects and from here on out it's really about just blending these shots together you can see the bird pass right here a lot of these are just going to be click and drag as long as you set after effects to interpret these as 30 fps shots of course because they are just image sequences so you don't have to tell after effects you know what they are for our lake we have some brightness and contrast and hue and saturation adjustments and i wanted to give the illusion of depth so i needed that dirt to come in a little bit around the edges of our pond what i did is i made a copy of our lake right here lake for alpha and then i made a layer called footage for lake i set the track mat to alpha inverted of that lake for alpha so basically this footage layer is only going to appear where the lake isn't i used the refine hard mat effect on that extra lake layer and i set the feathering to 130 pixels and i shifted the edge by 100 percent so basically it's creating a fade this auxiliary footage layer is using that so that's how i have the footage only appear lightly around the edges i have the rocks placed underneath that additional footage layer as well so they basically inherit the texture of the original terrain i also duplicated our rock footage and put one up here and set that blend mode to soft light so it's making them come through just a little bit more our clouds were rendered in two pieces the clouds themselves and then the cloud shadow you know the shadow kept being cast by the cloud i created a shadow catcher in blender and over on the other side we have our biplane and we have our balloon both of those have the brightness really ramped up and also i'm adding a little bit of extra blur I'll notice in our original footage we can actually see the edge of our diorama in some shots so i rendered these extensions they're just planes with uh, the original texture of our diorama projection mapped on and placed cleverly so that they look like extensions. For our final, final composite, I've applied a warp stabilizer to the whole composite, which is pretty computationally expensive, so it's going to take a while. And then I added a glow effect to add a little bit of mystique to the top of those mountains. And I added a lumetri color effect for the color grade. I really like this lookup table. It gives a nice clean look to the shot. So that's a very brief overview of how this project was put together. I hope to continue combining practical effects, visual effects, and programming into one project. I think these types of projects are very rewarding. So if you would like to see more, definitely subscribe because there will be a lot more on the way.